Hi, welcome to this video where we'll look into the browser Windows local storage property to persist data between user sessions. On this page on the Mozilla Developer Network site, it tells us that local storage is a read-only property of the browser's window, which allows us to persist data between user sessions based on the origin of the site serving the web page the user is viewing. So what does all that mean? Well, let me show you an example. Here I have a simple web page for creating a shopping list. When the page loads, there are no items on the list. If I refresh the page, still no items on the list. If I add an item, I see the item show up in the list. And if I refresh the page, the item is still there. And now I have a button to clear local storage. So if I clear it and reload the page, now I have no more items. And in fact, if I put that item back and then maybe add some eggs and then close the browser and come back in, now we see I have my two items. Of course, if I clear local storage and exit the browser and come back in, I no longer have the items. Now, it's the browser's local storage that allows us to store the items between user sessions. If I open up developer tools, then go to the application tab and under storage, look for local storage and then click the address at the site that I'm currently on, which is my local machine 127001 running on port 5500. I see there are no values in local storage. If I go back and I add milk, and I refresh local storage, we see that I have a key value pair now. The key is persisted items. The value is an array with one object literal. The object literal has two properties, the name, which is milk, and the quantity, which is one. If I go back and add eggs and refresh, now we see that there are two items in the persisted items array, milk and eggs. If I refresh the page, I see the milk and eggs listed because the persisted item key is in local storage. If I clear local storage and then refresh the page, as we saw before, there are no more items. So that's what the Mozilla Developer Network means by allowing us to persist data between user sessions based on the origin the site is serving the web page from. And in my case, the origin is my local development machine. So let's jump in the code and see how this is implemented. Here's the HTML for the web page. It has a simple form with a submit button and an unordered list to display the items we add to our list. I'm including two JavaScript files, a scripts.js, which has the application logic inside of functions, and an item.js, which is just a constructor function for instantiating items. The constructor function takes two parameters, a name and a quantity, and then it sets the name and quantity properties for this instance of an item. In the window on load function of the scripts.js file, I start out by creating a variable called list items, which is an empty array, which will eventually hold the list item objects that we create from the form. I then create variables to hold the form elements by going to the DOM, the document object model, and getting the element where the ID attribute on the HTML element matches the value in the function. I'm then calling a check for existing items function passing the list items array and the clear storage element. If I go up to the check for existing items function, I have an if statement which checks the type of storage, capital S, so this is the browser's storage object, to make sure it's not equal to undefined. So what this if statement does is check to see if the browser supports local storage. And that should be the case in modern browsers. So if local storage is supported, I'll create a variable named persisted items. And then I want to go to local storage. And this is the browser's local storage and call the get item function. And I'm going to pass to it the key that I want to try and retrieve items from. So if you remember, if we jump back into the browser and I go back to the application and add an item, refresh to local storage, now we have a key named persisted items. I gave that key the name persisted items. I could have called it my shopping list items, whatever I wanted to, but it's important to remember that when you put the items in local storage and then get the items from local storage, you have to use the same key 
so that when the browser goes to local storage to find the item, you're targeting the proper key. So in this case, I'm going to local storage, I'm calling the get item function, and I'm passing the key that I wanna get the values from. Now I'll execute a conditional to see if persisted items is not equal to null. So basically we're checking to say, do I have a key in local storage named persisted items? And if I do, then this won't be equal to null, and I can execute the code inside of the conditional. Now the first time through, let's go ahead and clear this and we'll simulate the first time a user comes to the application, right? There aren't gonna be any items in local storage because it's the first time they came here, they haven't added any items yet. So when the browser goes to local storage to look for that persisted item keys, there won't be any. So at this point in time, this conditional will evaluate to false and will exit the function. So then we drop back down here into the window on load function and I'm taking the variable, the form, which is equal to the element with the ID of the form. And if we go back, right, that's the actual form element. And I'm adding an event listener. And the event listener that I'm listening for is for the form to be submitted. So when the user clicks the add item button, they'll be submitting the form and then this code will execute. Now I know we haven't gotten to event handlers in the tutorial series yet, but I'm hoping that the submit event listener on the form is simple enough to follow along with. So when the event listener is triggered, so when the form is submitted, I want to execute this anonymous function. And I'm gonna pass something in the anonymous function, and that something is gonna be the actual event. I just abbreviated it here with the letter E. So the first thing I wanna do here is prevent the default behavior on the event. So remember, if you submit a form, it's going to go to the value of the action property in the form element. If you don't have an action property, it's just going to reload the same page. Well, in this case, I don't want the form to submit. I don't want the page to reload or go to another page in the website. So calling the prevent default method on the event will prevent the default form submission behavior and the page will stay right where it is. And the reason for that is I don't want to navigate away from this page and I don't want to reload it. When I submit the form, I wanna stay here and then I wanna update the DOM. So now again, we're in the submit event handler of the form, we've prevented the default behavior. And now I'm gonna create a variable for the items name value. And I'll get that by going to the item name variable, which is equal to the element on the form with the ID of item name, and that's the name input field. I'll get its value and then I'll call the trim method, which will trim any leading or trailing spaces. Then I'm going to do the same for the item quantity. And once I have the values that the user entered for the name and the quantity, I'm gonna create a variable named valid, and it's gonna be the result of calling the validate function and passing it the item name value, the item quantity value, and then a variable name message, which is equal to the element on the page with the ID of message. And if we go back to the HTML, there's a span with an ID of message. And that's there in case the user tries to submit the form and doesn't enter all the values. So back in the code, we're passing the user entered item name value, the quantity value, and the message to the validate function. So let's jump up and look at the validate function. So it creates a variable, valid, and it sets it to false by default. And then we're gonna check to see if the item name value is equal to an empty string. And that's the case that the user didn't enter a value in the name field and we'll set the inner HTML of the message, which we're passing in as a parameter, to the error message, please enter an item name. And we'll also check the quantity and do the same. If it is the case that the user didn't enter an item name or they didn't enter a quantity, we're not gonna change the value of the valid variable. So when it's returned, it will be false. So if we jump back down into the window on load where we're calling validate, if it returns false, then this conditional will be false and it won't get executed. So basically, there's no action for the code to take. The only action that happened was the user submitted the form, we tried to validate it, we saw they either didn't enter a name for the item or a quantity, and we displayed the error message on the page, and now we're waiting for the user to take some action, enter the name and or the quantity. So let's say they enter the name and the quantity and they click submit again. We come back in, the submit event handler is triggered, we prevent the default behavior, we get those values again, and then we pass them to validate. So back up and validate, this time, this is gonna be false, so the user entered a name, and they entered a value, 
So we're going to jump into this else statement and we're going to change the value of the valid variable to true. So now we're going to return true. So back down here now is valid. It's going to be true. So now we're going to call the display item function, passing it the value that the user entered for the name and the value that the user entered for the quantity and the variable for the item list which points to the HTML element that is the unordered list on the page. So if we go up and look at the display item function, we see that we're creating a variable named item to add and we're setting it equal to a concatenated string for a list item. And then we'll set the inner HTML property of the item list, which we passed in as a parameter, to be equal to whatever it currently has in the HTML plus this string that we just added. So if we jump back into the web page and we inspect this, We'll see here's the unordered list with the ID of item list. And now it has one list item with the text that we just appended to that string and used to set the inner HTML for the list item. So now that we've added the item to the page, we'll return from the display item function and then we'll call the populate array function, passing it the list items, which is the array, which is empty the first time we came in here, the item name and the item quantity. So let's go up and take a look at populate array. In the populate array function, We'll create a variable called item and it will be equal to a new item object and the item object has a constructor function in the item js file it takes two parameters name and quantity and we'll set the values for the properties for this instance of the item so after calling the constructor function we have an instance of a new item object and that's stored in the item variable then we'll push to the list items array the new item, and then we'll console.log list items. So let's jump back into the browser. We'll go to the console, clear local storage, reload the page. We'll add milk, click add item. And now we see in the console, we have the list items array with one element in it. And it the element is an instance of an item object. If we expand that, we see at the zeroth element, we have the item with the two properties. So populate array has completed and we return and now we're going to go back to local storage and this time instead of calling get item we're going to call set item and set item takes two values the first is the string for the name of the key and that's the key in local storage the second value is the list items which is an array that has right now one instance of an item object in it but we can't store objects in local storage we can only store strings so we're going to call json stringify passing it the array of objects which will turn it into a json string which is what we see in local storage for the value then we call the reset form function passing the name the quantity and the message and that just sets the item name value to an empty string the quantity is cleared out then it sets the focus of the cursor into the item name field so that's the path of execution when the user comes to our page for the first time there are no items in local storage so when we go to check for existing items there's nothing to return so we just wait and listen for the submit event handler on the form for the user to enter an item now Let's follow the path of execution for when the user comes back into the browser after they've already added items. So the page loads, we're in the window on load function, and we call the check for existing items function, passing the list items array and the clear storage button. Once again, we check to see if local storage is supported by the browser. Of course it is. And then we'll create the variable persisted items by going to local storage, calling get item, and looking for the key of persisted items. And in this case, we have one. So when get item returns, persisted items will now have values in it. So when we check to see if persisted items is not equal to null, this time the conditional evaluates to true. So we take the persisted items, and now we need to parse it using JSON back into an array with the object in it. So remember when we put the item in local storage, we took it from an array with an object and stringified it. So now that we have it back out, we need to convert the string back to an object. So that's what persisted item is now. And then we write it to the console, which is what we see here. So remember persisted items is an array that has data in each element. So we're gonna loop through the persisted items array. Each time through, we'll create a variable named item and we'll set it equal to the value at the ith element in the persisted items array. And for us, that's gonna be this item with the name milk and the quantity one. 
So then we'll create the variable item name value, set it equal to the name property of the item and the quantity equal to the quantity property of the item. We'll then call populate array, passing the list items, the name and the value, which will instantiate the instance of the item and push it to the array. Then we'll call display item, passing the value, the quantity in the item list, which will build the list item string and append it to the elements in our HTML. Finally, we'll call the init clear storage button passing it the clear storage value, which is passed in as a parameter, which will bind the click event listener to the button and execute the anonymous function when the button is clicked, which will call the remove item from local storage and remove the item where the key is persisted items. This function will return, this function will return, and then we'll listen for the submit event on the form for the user to add additional items. So that's a simple implementation of using the browser windows local storage property. I hope you enjoyed the demo and I also hope to see you in the next video where we'll take a proper look at event handling.